Let's begin today with, uh, we have a sort of superstar, an expert in the field of computer security. Ankit Fadia is with us today. We are thrilled to have him here. Besides being a wide-selling author, as I had uh, mentioned, he is a security expert, cybersecurity expert, and has published 16 books, delivered more than 1,000 talks in over 25 countries, and has trained over 20,000 people in India and China. So we are absolutely thrilled and honored to have him here with us today. He is going to be talking to you about and showing you exactly how a robust cyber security system is imperative in establishing a successful and effective digital India. With that, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and give Ankit Fadia a big warm welcome. All right, uh, good morning everybody. Computer security is indeed an issue of global concern. It's an issue of concern, not only in boardrooms across the globe, but even for common users in India and globally who use the internet just for educational or entertainment purposes. I'd like to start today's session by asking all of you certain questions that will make you realize how dangerous or how less private the internet has made our lives. How many of you in this audience have email accounts with Hotmail, Yahoo, Gmail, India Times, or Rediff? Stop using them. Hotmail, Yahoo, Gmail, India Times, Rediff put together probably has a few hundred million users across the globe. But did you know that each and every email being sent or received by all those millions of users is actually being scanned for some keywords? In other words, if you were to send an email with the keywords, kill Obama, immediately you're blacklisted, a background check is done on you, and if any links between you and any terrorist organization is found, then obviously you're caught. Otherwise, you're let go free. How many of you use Google.com? Stop using it. So Google is actually known to keep a track of each and every user's searching habits on the internet. In other words, each time you connect to Google.com, whatever keywords you type into Google.com, they're actually getting recorded in the permanent database of Google, along with your name, or at least along with something known as the IP address of your computer. How many of you use antivirus software? Stop using them. In the underground hacking community, There'll be a lot of people who'll argue that a lot of times antivirus companies have been known to create viruses, create worms, releasing the, release them on the internet, infect all your systems, and then sell you a countermeasure. How many of you use Microsoft Windows? Stop using it. Because if you remember, each time an error takes place on Microsoft Windows, uh, there will be a small dialog box that will ask you whether you wish to report that error message to Microsoft or not. Now, obviously, if you click on no, then nothing happens. But if you click on yes, along with that error message, a complete list of system configuration information about your system gets transferred to Microsoft. One last question. How many of you use the internet? Stop using it. Because no matter what you do online, every single move of yours is being watched, is being recorded, is being logged on some server or the other. Now, obviously, it's not possible for any of us in this room to stop using the internet, which is why today's presentation, or today's, the topic of today's presentation becomes so important. Because what I'm gonna try and do in the next half an hour or so, I'm gonna try and talk like a criminal, I'm gonna act like a criminal, and most of the things that I'm going to show you today are going to be extremely illegal. But don't get alarmed. The idea is not to convert all of you to cyber criminals. But the whole idea is that if you do not even know how cyber criminals work today, there is no way you can protect yourself against the same criminals. So to catch a criminal, even you need to start thinking like one. Now, digital India. 
I'm sure all of you have heard about Digital India, read about Digital India for the last year or so. That's, that's been around us in every single blog, every single uh, newspaper, magazine, and so on. Now, Digital India has a bunch of different pillars, a lot of different initiatives that all of us as Indians need to be proud of. But I'd like to actually just start by sharing with all of you my personal favorite initiative slash pillar of Digital India, which is something known as a digital locker. How many of you have used the digital locker service? Great. So I'll encourage all of you. One takeaway after the, if, uh, from this presentation should be I'll encourage all of you to go back home, create an account on digital uh, locker. Uh, essentially, it's a government service where any subscriber of digital locker, and a subscriber could be some, somebody like the passport authority or the PAN card issuer, any subscriber can actually issue digital government documents through the digital locker. All you need is your Aadhaar card, and you can log on, on to your digital locker using your Aadhaar card, and you can digitally download any of your government documents, your uh, you know, college passing certificate, or birth certificate, pretty much any kind of uh, government document that generally you would have to run from pillar to post to get. Now you can actually get it online, sitting at home, using digital locker. Now, why do I talk about Digital Locker? Now, Digital Locker is one of my personal favorite uh, pillars and in initiatives of Digital India. And along with Digital Locker, there are a bunch of other things that are going to happen in the next five to 10 years in India. But for Digital India to be successful, all Indians need to be more security conscious, need to be more aware about cybersecurity. So what I'd like to do in today's presentation is share with you 10 most common most dangerous cybersecurity threats and issues that Indians are currently facing. And I'd like to actually start by sharing a couple of real life examples that are pertaining to the first issue, which is invasion of privacy. And the first example is from Mumbai. This happened maybe six or seven years ago. There was a lady in Mumbai who lived in a typical Mumbai apartment, which is a one room apartment. And this lady had this habit of chatting on the internet for several hours together. One evening when the lady was chatting on the internet, the person with whom she was chatting managed to hack into the lady's computer and infected her computer with a spying software called a Trojan. And once the computer was infected with the Trojan, the criminal probably sitting in some other part of the world remotely, secretly used that Trojan to switch the lady's web camera on. So from that moment, whatever happened in the lady's apartment was being broadcasted live on the internet 24 hours a day. And this lady had absolutely no knowledge that something so terrible was happening to her. Life continued for a few weeks, after which the lady went for a job interview. And at that job interview, the person who was sitting across the desk from the lady, he immediately said, oh, I'll definitely give you the job. I see you every day on that pornography website. Why would I refuse? And that's the time the lady realized that something so terrible was happening to her. She rushed back home, disconnected the computer from the internet, complained to the police, investigations were carried out, but unfortunately the criminal was never caught. And in the meantime, the lady probably never wanted to use the internet again. Another example, how many of you use Android phones? Excellent. So I personally love uh, Android phones, and I've been using an Android for the last several years now. However, there is a slight problem with Android phones. Uh, the problem is that Google likes to track the location of every single Android user globally. So no matter where you go, as long as you, your phone is with you, and as long as it is connected to some kind of cell phone tower, a Wi-Fi network, or your location sharing is on, Google is able to track exactly where you go. In fact, a few months ago, in, uh, I think early 2015, Google launched a website where any Android user can log on and see all the location information that Google has been recording about them ever since they started using an Android phone. So just to give an example, this is what, let me replicate my screen so that all of you can see what I'm showing. So this is what the website looks like. 
essentially there's, it looks exactly like Google Maps, and uh, you can choose any year or month from this uh, drop-down menu. So let's, let's go back to maybe March 2014, and I can choose, say, 15th or 16th of March. So it will, within a few seconds, search the database and show you the exact location information about me based on my Android phone. So if you notice, so I was studying at Stanford in 2014. This is my apartment, 376 College Avenue. And it tells you what time I woke up, what time I left the apartment, and where all I went throughout the day. Now this is, as a, as a Google user, or as an Android user, there are a lot of advantages if my location is being shared with Google. But then it raises a lot of uh, privacy concerns as well. What if somebody hacks into my Gmail account and gains access to this information? What if somebody hacks into the Google server and gains access to, the, to this information? Fortunately, it is possible to disable location sharing so that Google does not actually record your location information. But my question is, how many people actually disable that from their Android phone? So this is a great way to quickly move to the second thing that I wanted to share with all of you, which is how to be completely anonymous on the internet. So all of us understand the privacy risks that exist on the internet. Uh, fortunately, there are solutions available. And one of my personal favorite solutions is a software called Tor. So Tor is available as a free download on the internet. It's also available for your phone. So there's an app called Orbot that you can download free of cost uh, from the internet. And Tor allows you to bounce off your internet connection off three different randomly selected servers in three different parts of the world. And it basically hides your IP address, hides your location, and hides your identity so that you can actually be completely uh, safe and secure and anonymous on the internet. So I'd like to quickly show you Tor. So if all of you look at the screen, this is my Google Chrome browser, which is not using Tor. And if I go to whatismyipaddress.com, it has uh, identified my IP address, my location as well. However, if I use Tor, so Tor comes with its own browser. And once you're connected to Tor, if you then go to whatismyipaddress.com, if you notice currently my IP address has changed, my location is also changed. So I'm using the same laptop, same internet connection, two different browsers, but my IP address, my identity can be completely changed. And if you are committing a crime, and if you don't want the police to actually be able to trace you back, you could just change your identity by clicking on the new identity button. And within a few seconds, it will find you three, three new servers to bounce off your connection and uh, give you a completely new identity on the internet. So Tor is fabulous if you want to hide your uh, identity on the internet. It is also fabulous if you want to unblock access to websites that are blocked by the government, blocked by your employer, or blo blocked by the college that you're studying on. So that's Tor. Now, uh, an app very similar to Tor is something known as Ola. So if you're in India, and if you want to access all your favorite American TV shows and movies for free, so there are websites like Netflix or Pandora or Hulu. Some of these are paid, some of them are free, but generally they will not work in India. So if you want to be able to use these websites in India, just download this Google Chrome app called Ola. It gets installed within your browser. You use your browser to connect to any of your favorite websites that normally will not work in India. Automatically, Ola will change your identity, give you an American IP address, and you will be able to start using these services absolutely free of cost. The next thing, or the next concern that a lot of Indians have in a digital India are spoofing attacks. As more and more people, more and more Indians come online, uh, the, the threat of spoofing attacks, like email spoofing, are only going to increase. So email spoofing is, like the name suggests, a technique that allows a criminal to send a fake or a spoofed email that looks like a real email from somebody else's email account. In fact, there is a website called mk.cz, which is a free website that anybody can access. And using this website, they can actually send a spoofed email to a victim. So I'm just going to quickly open up this website and show it to all of you. Essentially, just start your browser, connect to mk.cz. And this is what the website looks like. All you got to do is 
type in the from name from email address. So say for example, I want to send an email to a friend of mine from Bill Gates at Microsoft.com, offering my friend a job at Microsoft or with Bill Gates or whatever, right? So all I need to do is type the from name from email address, type the to email address, type the subject of the email, so job proposal, and in this in this input field, you can type the actual body of the email. So I'm going to type something like, Dear Varun, heard a lot about you from my representatives in Mumbai. Would you like to work as part of my personal technical advisory team here in Redmond? Of course, a nine-figure US dollar salary will be offered to you. Please call me at your convenience on my personal cell phone. That's not the real number. Stop copying it down. Thanks a ton. Warm regards, Bill. Or maybe Billu. And when you're ready to send the email, all you got to do is click on send. And a few minutes later, when my friend checks his inbox, he would probably have received an email from Bill Gates at Microsoft.com offering him a job with Bill Gates at Microsoft. The best part is the email will look very real, very authentic. And the absolutely best part is if my friend falls for the trick, replies to the email, the reply will obviously go back to Bill Gates at Microsoft.com. Now, I'm not saying that solutions do not exist. There are software available that will easily detect email spoofing. But the question is, how many people know that email spoofing exists, and how many people are actually using the solutions to protect themselves? Now, to be honest, email spoofing has been around for many years now. And nowadays, criminals have already you know, stopped using email spoofing, and they have moved on to something known as SMS spoofing where you'll receive an SMS from maybe your loved ones, maybe your parents, your spouse, or your kids, or your best friend. And when you look at the SMS, it will look very real because your best friend's or your parent's number will show up. And whatever name you use to save that number will also show up. And uh, most people will tend to trust the SMSs that they get. So think about the following scenario. Maybe your parents or my parents, who are in their uh, 60s, receive an SMS from my cell phone and asking them to tra make a transfer of some money because I need some money for whatever reasons. A lot of times, people will fall for that trick. People may not actually you know, pick up the phone and talk to the concerned person to verify whether the SMS is real and may actually transfer the money. And SMS spoofing, once again, there's a website for it. So, so what is really alarming about cybersecurity is that everything is easy. There are tools, there are ready-made software available that anybody can use. So for SMS spoofing, there's a website called smsgang.com. The only problem with this website is it's not free. So it'll cost you around 100 rupees per spoofed SMS that you want to send out, which may sound a lot compared to one pesa for an SMS that a lot of us are used to. But uh, if you think about the amount of uh, you know, damage that you can cause using SMS spoofing, then 100 rupees per SMS is nothing. All you got to do is type in the to SMS number, the from number, type pay for it, type in the actual SMS, and click on send SMS. In fact, this website is so professionally developed, it will automatically tell you whether you know, uh, sending a spoofed SMS in India works or not. And you can also get a list of operators with which SMS spoofing will work within India. So they are not trying to cheat you or steal your credit card details and never send the spoofed SMS. It's a very professionally run website, surprisingly. Right, so that's, that's spoofing attacks. Let's quickly move on to the next very commonly found threat that the average internet user in India faces. Mobile phone spying. Uh, I get a lot of emails from people saying that I think my girlfriend is cheating on me or I think my boyfriend is cheating on me. Can you please help me hack into their mobile phone because I want to find out who they are WhatsApping, 
what pictures they have, where they are going, and who they are speaking to. Now, obviously, it's illegal to hack into other people's mobile phones, but if you have physical access to somebody's mobile phone, it's extremely easy to download any of these spying software. It's almost like the modern day version of a private detective or a jasus. So you don't need to hire a private detective anymore. You can download any of these apps, install it on the victim's phone, and give the phone back to the victim. So either you need to find an excuse to borrow the victim's phone, or what has started happening in corporate India, or the corporate world of digital India, is that for Diwali gifts, or for New Year's, a lot of times CEOs will receive a brand new iPhone or a brand new Android phone from their clients. And people are very happy to receive such, you know, uh, technology savvy gifts. And either they end up using it themselves or they give it to their family members or close friends. But what they don't realize is that a lot of times the person who gave the gift has bought the phone, pre-installed the spying software on it, and then kind of packed it up again and then sent it out to you. So you got to be extremely careful uh, accepting mobile phones as corporate gifts because nowadays you have a lot of private information being stored on your mobile phone. And the way these apps work is, once you've installed it on the victim's phone, you log on to the website of the, of the app. You obviously got to create an account beforehand. And on the website, you'll be able to see everything that's happening on the victim's phone. So who they are WhatsApping, who they are texting, who they are calling, all uh, confidential photos and videos that they take will be uploaded to the website. And there will be a Google map on the website where you can see the location information about that person as well. These apps, most of them work on obviously Android. Some of them work on iPhone, uh, Windows phones as well. They will not work on old Nokia phones. So that is out of the question. Secure communication. So that's a concern for most of us. Now, whenever somebody asks me how do I securely communicate with my friends, I try and find out what the terrorists are nowadays using. So if you look at ISIS, I, uh, there are a lot of reports that ISIS has been using secure communication apps like Wicker, Telegram, and Redphone. So these are basically apps like WhatsApp, where you can text somebody else, you can exchange files, exchange photos, you can even make VoIP uh, phone calls like Skype. The only difference is they use military-grade encryption, uh, and there are, there are security mechanisms that you can use to ensure that the person that you're speaking to on the other end is actually the person that they claim to, claim to be. So to give you an example, you will Say, if I want to make a secure phone call with you, and I want to make sure it's you that I'm speaking to, and I don't really recognize your voice, then I need to send you like a one-time password through some other channel, and then you need to type it in into the app. Only then, I'll, uh, to kind of authentic your, uh, authenticate your identity, only then will I actually start the phone call with you. So these are apps that are freely available on app stores that everybody should be downloading if they're concerned about their about the security and privacy of their messages, because not only do they give you encryption, the messages that you send will self-destruct, so you not leave, it's kind of like Snapchat, encryption, uh, and WhatsApp put together. So uh, highly recommended if you have confidential messages that you're exchanging with somebody else. Phishing attacks. I'm sure all of you have heard about phishing attacks. They have been around for many, many years now. The only problem nowadays is that phishing attacks are becoming even more sophisticated by the day. To give you an example, there is something known as an HTML5 full screen API attack. So I'll just give you a, like a demo of what it looks like. So typically in phishing attacks, what people, let me again project my screen. So typically in phishing attacks, what happens is you are shown a fake login screen. Right? So if all of you look at the screen, this is the bankofamerica.com kind of login screen. Now, a quick way to detect whether a screen is a fake login screen or a real login screen is obviously to look at the URL. But in this attack, what has happened is 
the criminal has run some script that puts your browser in full screen mode, and what you see at the top is actually an image. So they have taken a screenshot of bankofamerica.com, they put your browser in full screen mode, and the image of bankofamerica.com is kind of put at the position right at the top. So you think that you're connected to the real login screen of bankofamerica.com, but actually it's just a full screen phishing attack. So phishing attacks are becoming more and more sophisticated. To give you another example, there is something known as tab napping. How many of you, when you're browsing the internet, have multiple tabs open in your browser? I think all of us do that, right? Because we are super busy and we can't, we have attention spans that last only for five seconds, so we need multiple tabs open simultaneously. However, that could pose a security risk. To give you an example, so if you look at my browser, I have one, two, three, four, five, six different tabs open, right? So imagine that I open up crickinfo.com, I open up citibank.com, Gmail, Facebook, I keep moving back and forth between tabs, and after a while I wanna go back to the Citibank tab to log in. I go back to the Citibank login screen, type my username and password, but actually if you look carefully, it's a fake login screen. So I'll repeat this. I don't know if you can see it, but the name of this tab, I think now you'll be able to see it. The name of this tab is testing, right? I move to another tab, keep looking at testing. Wait for like three, four seconds. What happened to testing? Testing was automatically changed to some other tab, and that is what tab napping is all about. In tab napping, if you have multiple tabs open in your browser, it is possible for the criminal to run simple JavaScript code. So imagine I run a blog. You come to my blog, you have other stuff open in your browser. I will run JavaScript code to figure out your history, find out which bank you normally bank with, and I'll automatically change the contents of my blog to something else the moment my tab is inactive. And when you come back to my tab, a lot of times you may forget whether you opened this website or did you log in already or not, and it is, it's basically a combination of phishing attacks and also a little bit of uh, you know, redirection kind of attacks. So spoofing attacks uh, combined with phishing attacks are making uh, life for the average internet user who just wants to access their bank account online or access their services online much harder. Cyber terrorism is on the rise. Uh, I think, like I said, on most occasions in the security field, terrorists are trendsetters in terms of using the latest method of communicating, latest method of, of encryption. Uh, the example that I like to share with all of you is technography. Right after the September 11th attacks, the US government intercepted a few encrypted emails that were believed to have been sent by the Al-Qaeda. And the problem was when the government opened those emails, the only thing that they found was photographs like these. Photographs of actors, actresses, celebrities, and so on. But the actual emails were completely blank. So the government was very confused. Why is the Al-Qaeda sending photos to each other? So after a lot of investigation, what was found was that the terrorists were using stenography. And stenography is basically the art of taking a file or a message and hiding it inside a photograph, a song, or a video. In other words, when all of you look at this photograph, it looks quite normal. When in reality, behind this photograph, there is some kind of message or file that has been hidden or that has been embedded. So let me now quickly give a demonstration to all of you that shows you how all of you can go back home today and take all the dirty secrets that you have that you want to hide and hide them inside photographs, songs, or videos. The name of the software that you need, which is available as a free download on the internet, is S-Tools, right? And this is what S-Tools looks like. And the way it works is the following. Imagine for a moment that I am a terrorist, and I'm planning a major terrorist attack in New Delhi, and I want to send this message to my terrorist team members, bomb the parliament building on 25th December at 9 a.m. Actually, you know what? 9 a.m. is very early for me to wake up, so let's do it at 11 a.m. Now, if I were to send this message as a regular email, 
then anybody who intercepts the email will obviously know what the message means. And since I am a terrorist, I don't want anybody to know what I'm communicating. So what I like to do instead is I like to take this message and I like to hide it inside an appropriate photograph. And the photograph that I like to use is Barack Obama's photograph. So how do I make that happen? All you got to do is open up S tools. So this is what, like I said, S tools looks like. Drag the photograph inside which you want to hide that secret message. Drag the uh, file that you want to hide inside the photograph. Uh, let's try this again. Okay, let me close this and start it again. Generally, it works. Okay. There you go. So you got to drag it onto the photograph and not just uh, in the app. So it is asking me to choose a password. So you can choose any password of your choice. And within a few seconds, if all of you look at the screen, the software has created an identical copy of the photograph. Can anybody in the audience point out any differences between the, photo, between the two photographs? You can even count the number of stars on the flag. It, 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 there are no, there's no difference at all. The human eye cannot differentiate between the two pictures. They're exactly the same. The file size may change depending on how big is the text file that you're hiding inside this photograph. But even if the file size changes, it doesn't matter because there is no way for the police to know the file size of every single photograph that exists in the world, right? So let me go ahead and close the photograph on the left because that does not contain the hidden data. This contains the hidden data. I can right click on it, save it with any file name of my choice, attach it to an email, send it to my terrorist colleagues. If anybody intercepts the email, they'll only see the smiling photograph of Barack Obama. But when my terrorist colleague receives this email, all that he or she needs to do is drag this photograph back onto the software, right click on it, click on reveal, and uh, Enter the same password that was used earlier, re-enter that password, and within a few seconds, the secret file is now ready to be revealed. So let me go ahead and save it on the desktop and open it for all of you. And when I open the secret file, it says, bomb the parliament building on 25th December at 11 a.m. As simple as that. Now, what is really shocking about this demonstration is that this is the communication technique that the Al-Qaeda was using in 2001, 14 years ago. So you can imagine what they are today using. So the terrorists are always a few steps ahead of the good guys as far as cybersecurity is concerned. How do you protect your kids on the internet? There is a lot of content on the internet that may not be appropriate for kids. So two simple solutions, which I'm sure a lot of parents in the audience are already using. So there's an app called Net Nanny, which you can use to block all inappropriate content and websites like pornography, etc., from the, uh, from, from the internet. And there's another app which I highly uh, recommend called Tokomail. So if your kids are maybe 10 years old or 11 years old, and if they're insisting that they should get their own email address, then Tokomail is an app that you should use to monitor their email usage. So Tokomail allows you to create a a loud list of email addresses that your kids can communicate with. So maybe your, maybe their friends, maybe your family members, etc. Any email coming from anywhere else will first come to your phone on the Tokomail app, and you can choose whether you want to approve it or reject it or not. So almost like a gatekeeper for all email access for your kids. And it's a freely available app that runs on iPhones and Android uh, mobile phones. Now, cybersecurity is not limited to just to the online world. Uh, even ATM machines can be hacked into. And in this slide, I'm going to show you four simple photographs of how an ATM machine normally gets hacked. So that typically, an ATM machine has two layers of security. Number one is the magnetic strip behind your ATM card that stores account information. And number two is the four-digit PIN number that you type at the ATM machine. So in this slide, on the left top corner, you can see that the criminal is attaching an additional reading device on top of the ATM machine. And on the right hand side, top corner, this is what the modified ATM machine looks like. Looks quite normal to me. And I would probably not think twice before inserting my ATM card into this uh, AT modified ATM machine. So the first layer of security has been compromised. 
Left bottom corner, the criminal is attaching a small wireless camera to the marketing brochure holder, which is then kept at a very strategic location, such that the customer can never see the camera, but the camera is able to take a video or a lot of photographs of the uh, numeric keypad where the four-digit PIN number is being typed. And the very next day, copies of your ATM card would be sold over the internet in some other part of the world. In fact, there is a website which I like to kind of just share with all of you where you can actually go online and buy a stolen credit card or a compromised POS machine. So it's become as simple as if you search for rescatter, I think .cm. So rescatter.cm, let me make sure that all of you can see it. Yeah, rescatter. It's an online forum where criminals who have stolen credit card numbers are using that as a marketplace to sell to potential buyers. So you pay $1,000, you get the credit card information of one, uh, say, credit card with a limit of $10,000. So it's up to you how quickly you kind of misuse it until it gets reported. And it's a global network where generally cards are stolen in one part of the world and then sold in another part of the world. Finally, even road signs can be hacked into. So in India, we don't have digital road signs, at least I have not seen one yet, but generally abroad you have road signs that show you traffic conditions ahead, maybe there's a diversion, uh, maybe there's an accident, and so on. Now, a couple of years ago, some hackers in Austin, Texas, thought that it would be a great idea to hack into a digital road sign and change the message that is flashing on it. So imagine that you're done with uh, with your day at this conference and you're driving back home late at night, maybe you're driving to Pune and on the expressway, suddenly you see the following message flashing by the expressway. So you have no idea what's going on. You don't know whether you need to speed up or slam the brakes or take the next exit. Now this is not a very tech savvy hack. If you wanna do it, the next time you're traveling abroad, if you see a digital road sign, just park your car, walk up to the digital road sign, and below the road sign, you're gonna see a control panel box. So typically at the bottom, you'll see some kind of control panel box. You open the control panel box, and inside the control panel box, you'll see a remote control. And by the way, make sure you're carrying a hammer with you, because this control panel box generally will have a small padlock. So you need the hammer to break the padlock, once you break the padlock, you open it, access this remote control, press the buttons on this remote control, follow the instructions on that small screen, and you will be able to change the message that is flashing on that digital road sign. However, a quick warning, in most countries, pretty much all countries, this is illegal, and if you get caught, you're probably gonna go to jail. So do it at your own risk. It's a lot of fun, but obviously it's, it's not exactly legal. I think we have a couple of more minutes. I'm gonna switch hats, stop talking like a criminal, and quickly show you like 10 simple things that you can do to protect yourself. Obviously, you still need to use an antivirus and anti-spyware on your phone and on your computer. Also have a firewall on your personal computer, something like Zone Alarm or McAfee or Norton would be great. If you can't remember your passwords, ideally you should remember all your passwords. Ideally, you should have different passwords for all your different accounts. Keep changing your passwords as well, but if that's just not possible, instead of choosing a weak password that you're repeating for all your accounts, use a password manager, which is much better. However, the only risk is that if somebody steals your phone, and if they're able to crack the master password of your password manager, then all your passwords get compromised. Email accounts, enable two-step authentication on all your email accounts, bank accounts, Facebook, Twitter, etc. If you have, um, data on your computer that you want to encrypt, use BitLocker. So use BitLocker to encrypt your hard drive, encrypt specific folders within your hard drive. Secure your mobile phone with an antivirus and also tools like Lookout in case it gets stolen. For your Wi-Fi networks at home, WPA2 security, anything more than 14 characters or 13 characters passwords, uh, enable MAC address filtering so that only certain devices with specific MAC addresses can connect to your network. When you're selling an old hard drive, a whole old laptop, a mobile phone, use a software like Eraser that will delete not only the alive files, but also deleted files. 
DOS attacks so now moving on to corporate security. So if, you, if you're worrying about DOS attacks, use solutions like uh, Cloudflare, DOS attacks or DDoS as well. Uh, enterprise protection, use firewalls like Checkpoint, Untangle, use an IDS slash IPS like Snort. Have strong security policies in your organization, which is, I can't uh, emphasize this point enough. That's extremely, extremely important. The more comprehensive are your security policies, the better is your uh, chance, uh, better are your chances of protecting your organization. Do regular security audits uh, every couple of weeks or every couple of months, depending on, depending on your industry and sector. And finally, especially from a corporate security perspective, you can have the best security software in place. You can be spending as much as you need to or maybe even more than that on security. But remember, the biggest threat for any company is not from anything that I discussed today, but is actually from their own employees. So never underestimate the, the human risk of, of your employees trying to hack into your network and stealing from you. So make sure that your security policies and your security software are not only external looking, but also internal looking. So on that note, that concludes my quick overview of top 10 common security issues that everybody is facing. My contact details are up on the screen. Ankitfire.com is my website. I look forward to uh, hearing from all of you. Any questions you have, you can drop me an email. On that note, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. It was fantastic interacting with all of you. Thank you.